Welcome listeners, welcome viewers to another episode in my teleseminar series called Trust After Trauma, Recapturing Faith and Living a Life of Power, Passion and Purpose After Tragedy. I'm really thrilled today to welcome PJ, PJ Dixon. And before I introduce him to you, uh, as I've been doing in, in the rest of the interviews in the podcast, we both going to set an intention for this interview. And what the intention is that this interview takes you to the place emotionally and spiritually and physically, if you need that, to where you need to be in order to make your transition from trauma to trust and, and begin to understand that you can recapture faith, you can live a life of power, passion, and purpose after tragedy. Um, both uh, PJ and I are examples of that. Um, so uh, I'm really, really thrilled, PJ. Uh, thank you for helping me set that intention for, for the, today's interview. And um, let me introduce PJ. Um, PJ is a lifelong motivational speaker. He calls himself a love guru or a relationship coach. And he's created a four-step program. Um, it's called Engaged in One Year. It's a personalized one-on-one -on -one coaching program for women uh, that is designed specifically to help you find the man of your dreams. Um, despite, so it, as you may see from uh, PJ, I don't know if you can notice from, from the view that you have, but he, he is he is disabled and he has a, a type of muscular dystrophy and he was expected to take his life by the age of seven, but he chose differently, as you can see. And he's not only chosen to live, but he's chosen to live well. Exactly what we're talking about, living a life of power, passion, and purpose. And so he's just perfectly suited for this series. And BJ, thank you so much for helping me to do this and joining us here. Welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I also have another four-step program called, called Learning to Love. So uh -huh. a lot of times people really don't even like themselves. So uh -huh. I help women and men, actually. It's fascinating how many men have come around um, uh -huh. to learn to love themselves also, which is really beautiful. Uh, is, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Which is the most important thing, right? That you, when, when you learn to love yourself is when you learn, when you attract. Yeah. And it's amazing because the process really is very simple right um mm -hmm. just a couple of the pieces are learning to just a couple of the pieces are learning to appreciate what you have and then mm -hmm. being grateful for it and yeah. i make a very clear distinction between the word appreciation and gratitude mm -hmm. if you look up the word appreciation the root of it means to appraise which means to set a value for to yeah. identify things that you like and dislike and that's really important that we're able to identify within our lives, what we like and what we don't like, what we appreciate and don't appreciate. Yeah. And even then, what, if we say we don't appreciate it, there's still an appreciation, there's still a setting of value, yeah. which is value much lower than something that we really enjoy. And then gratitude is literally the expression outwards, the giving outwards of that appreciation, the thanking. So for me, when you become super appreciative, you fill up so much, you fill, yeah. up, so much, you fill up so much, right? It spills out and becomes gratitude, it spills out of you and goes out of you. And you're thankful. Thank you so much for something that's been given to you or something that you've experienced almost every day. I will say, God, thank you for the eyes to see the heart to the eyes to see beauty and the heart to appreciate it. And that's super important for me because that keeps my heart moving in the right direction. And my eyes always looking for that, for that beauty. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so typically I start my interviews off by saying, uh, tell us a story, the story of your journey. And it, because we are talking right now about trauma, okay. to trust, um, relate that to, to the journey of your life and let our viewers get to know you a little bit. Okay, beautiful. I, um, for the people who can't see me, I'm gonna move around a lot. I'm kind of funny um, because of my disability. So I'm gonna back up so you can actually get a better look at me. Um, I was uh, born with a very rare form of muscular, of muscular dystrophy, right? And it was expected, like Sri Lapa said, it was expected to take my life by the age of seven. I hope you can still hear me okay. So if I'm back here, you can see my wheelchair, right? But um, you can also see, like, I have to move my body to even lift my arms 
because I don't have the ability to lift my arm. You see how skinny I am, right? Give me a good look. Um, and for me to lift my arm, I have to throw my body and then fling my arm. And then when I push my chair, I fling my arm back, put it on the chair, not my hand, but my forearm. Then I get the other, right now I'm just getting started, so I put my hand there, right? And then I lean forward and as I rock forward, it brings me forward, right? So um, if you see me squirming a lot, you'll know that, oh, he really is disabled. I got the um, So I was born with this amazing disability, this amazing disorder. I say amazing because there were only 25 people in the world that had what I have when I was 12, when I was 13, wow. right? In the seventh and eighth grade, when I was in the eighth grade, the doctor said there are 25 reported cases around the world. What? So if I had to have something, I got something good. And the doctor, when they finally dis uh, um, defined what I had or discovered what I had, I was three years old and they said that I would, um, you know what, I think I was closer to, I was four or five years old. I was somewhere in there. I always say three, but um, I didn't walk until I was two. And then when I did walk, I walked with leg braces. Um, and at about five years old, four or five years old, the doctors diagnosed me with a form of muscular dystrophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom said, well, I think I was three, actually, now that I remember the story. Sorry, forgive me for craziness. Um, and I'm not going to, like, I won't give you a whole, like, every little bit. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm three. When when you going to turn four, you know? So I'll just give you some of the key highlights. Yeah. When I was three, um, they diagnosed me with this rare form of muscular dystrophy. But when I was four, my mom said um, that I stood at this fence and watched my little five-year-old friends go off to school crying. And I wanted badly to go to school, right? Yeah. Because I wanted to be with my friends. And my mom said, okay, well, let me take him to the doctor and ask. And the doctor said, if you send this boy to school, he'll be dead by seven. That's second grade. And my oh. mom stopped for a moment and she paused and she looked at me and she said, well, it's his choice and it's his life. He gets to make a decision. What wow. a mom is going to give that kind of power to a child? My mom. The kind of woman who really wants to see the freedom come out of her son, right? And so she said, well, he gets to make that decision. And I went to school and here I am 47 or 40 years later. I'm 47 years old. I look pretty good, huh? Uh, <laughs> so cute. Um, so in between seven and 47, um, I had a pretty normal upbringing. Um, I was a pretty spiritual little guy. I never went to church. Um, mm -hmm. I rarely went to church, never went to the synagogue, um, the mosque, the temple, nothing like that, or very rarely, right? But I yeah. still remember being very, very spiritual, and at the age of five, standing outside of our apartment and saying to my, I even remember the moment of my two little friends that were with me, a little, uh, little boy named Todd and a little girl named Kim, and I stood there and I said, God is in that tree, and God is in that bush, and God yeah. is in the grass, and God is in you and me because God is in you and God is in me, that makes us brothers and sisters. Where oh did that come from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, where did that come from? I wasn't taught that. That's yes. just my, that was my knowing. So, yeah. um, and then at 10, I'm just giving you a couple of really imp yeah. important highlights, just so you get to know who I am a little bit, so you can understand the later questions um, and, um, and the transformation that maybe I went through. So yeah. nine and 10 years old, there was a, um, a, a moment when I sat down in prayer, and again, I wasn't really raised in the church. I was raised, you, you may, some of you may remember that um, old prayer, like, you know, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep yeah. <laughs> Well, my mom, you know, had us do that at night, but I remember being nine or 10 sitting on my bed and almost, I think I was crying and saying, God, give it to me, give me their suffering, give me their pain. So that no, and I was talking about every person in the world. And I was yeah. like, I'll carry their pain. I'll carry their suffering. I don't want them to suffer anymore. And mm -hmm. I was, I remember being profoundly scared. I was scared to death that God would give me their suffering, that God would give me their pain, yeah. right? Everybody's. Um, and, but I, I knew that I would take it. And I said, the only thing that I wanted, and this is a funny thing for a little kid to want. And I don't know why I tell this part, but just because I feel like it's part of the story and something that yeah. I remember. So I remember saying, I just want them to know that somebody took it, that I took it, that I don't want mm -hmm. them to take it back. I don't want them to feel bad. I just want them to know that I took it for them so they didn't have to, right? Wow. 
right. with it. Yeah. Uh, but that's my heart. So fast forward to um, going to college after college. Um, I'm going to hit a, uh, an important point. After college, um, I moved back into my mom's house because for some reason I just didn't know what to do. After yeah. college, I, like, I literally was like, what do I do now? For yeah. some reason, I didn't, I didn't know, like, go out and get a job. Like, I knew go out and get a job, but I, didn't, I don't think I knew how. So um, I moved back in with my mom. She lived out in the country. That was really rough because I, it was hard to get into town. And then um, at some point, we sold the house, moved into town. It was a lot easier. Um, and, uh, or into the city, I say into town, but into the city. Um, and so when we did that, um, I realized it wasn't where I wanted to be. And so, um, I just, I said, God, where do you want me to be? You know, yeah. I saw an image of a hummingbird in, in the clouds, um, a very clear, distinct hummingbird. And I knew that that represented somebody that I knew out in Tucson. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go to Tucson. After I made that decision, I just was, I went like two weeks later, I went. And in oh fact, there's, um, um, there is one quick, like, kind of caveat to that. I, yeah. um, I was on the phone with a friend of mine. I'm getting to the trauma right now. One more, like, one more. Yeah, that's uh, fine. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, it's funny. I'm giving you more than I normally give, and I don't know why. Um, well, remember our intention. We set the intention. Yes, what they want. exactly. So exactly. I'm just following that. Okay, yeah. so I'm, I'm on the phone with a friend of mine, and I don't remember where he lived, but he wasn't in Tucson, but wherever he was, he was happy. Yeah. And um, I was talking to him and I was like, man, I really just want to be out in Tucson. I want to be in Tucson doing the spiritual training. And because yeah. I, was, I wanted to go out to Tucson to, to grow spiritually. Yeah. And he's like, you're exactly where you want to be. And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't want to be stuck here in Ohio anymore. I yeah. want to be in Tucson doing my training. He's like, no, no, you're exactly where you want to be. And I was like, no, I want to be in Tucson doing that training. And he's like, you're exactly where you want to be. And I got frustrated. And I didn't yeah. pick up on him because I don't do that, but I did in the conversation relatively quickly. And this was 19, 20 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I hung up the phone and it took me a couple of days before my brain switched. And the moment my brain switched, I was like, Oh my God, I'm exactly where I want to be. And I'm only here because I've made all the decisions up to this point that have gotten me here. Yeah. I don't like where I am. So what do I have to do? Make a different decision. Yeah. <laughs> and two, like two weeks later, with one suitcase, one duffel bag, a sleeping bag, and my wheelchair, and four hundred dollars on my bank. That's it. I was in Tucson. Oh wow! Yeah. So I made a decision. I came to Tucson. Now that was October of '97. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, somewhere over the next couple of weeks, uh, or a couple of months, I started having these visions. Actually, let me back up because I forgot an important piece. Within that first week of being in Tucson, I started training with my spiritual teacher. And at that point, she suggested that I, um, I come home and sit in prayer and say, okay, God, um, I believe I'm meant to be in Tucson, but what is it that you want me to do? I'll do whatever you want. And then she said, but it's very important that you listen. So I said, okay, and I went home. I, to my, I was renting a room from a friend of mine. And I sat down on the floor, concrete floor. I was sleeping on concrete floor with a, a sleeping bag. and. Um, I sat down on that and closed my eyes and I said, God, where do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? I'll do anything that you want with my life. And I've been a speaker my whole life. I've been a speaker since I was seven years old, a motivational speaker that whole time. Um, and so partially because of, largely because of my disability. Yeah. So I say the prayer, God, you know, please tell me where you want me to be. What, what do you want me to do with this life? And this pillar of golden light came through the ceiling, hit me in the top of the head filled up my entire body and there was I was overwhelmed with this feeling and I heard one word love and I was mm -hmm. like okay I can do that but yeah. I've been loving my whole life so that wasn't anything new or big for me yeah I've always been about loving other people because I really struggled with loving myself in fact mm -hmm. I struggled with liking myself to a certain degree because of my disability yeah. I liked myself well enough by this point but um once I hit like junior high through yeah. high school and then some in college, you know, I struggled with liking myself yeah. because I was physically different. I didn't want to be disabled. I had a hard time, yeah. uh, you know, meeting women because of my disability. Yeah. So I didn't know how to get past that. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately I liked myself. I liked my heart, but I didn't, anytime somebody said, well, you just need to learn to love yourself. It's like, love yourself. Like, how do you love yourself? That doesn't even make sense to me. Yeah. After I had this prayer, after I had this epiphany where 
the light comes into me and says love, right? I'm like, oh, well, that's easy. Like, I'll just continue to do what I do, which is loving other people. Well, a couple of months later, I start getting these visions. Like mm. a month later, I start getting these visions of being hit at a bus stop by a car. Now, I don't drive, so I have to ride public transportation. Yeah. I literally was having visions of seeing myself get hit by a car, right? And so I would p- figure out how to position myself at the bus stop, think about, well, okay, if a car does jump the curb, which way can I jump out of my wheelchair? Yeah. Where should I sit? You know, this whole idea, right? Which direction should I face? And so three months of this goes by and I'm, a friend of mine drops me off. I'm walking to martial arts class about a mile and I walk by a bus stop. My mind is not thinking about this vision, right? I walk by a bus stop towards oncoming traffic. So I'm walking towards traffic coming at me. I see an SUV um, uh, right in front of me coming out or sp- stopped wanting to come out of the fast food restaurant that he's in, right? <clears throat> I see him. Looking to his left at the oncoming traffic, I look at oncoming traffic in front of me. I think in my head, there's no possible way he's going to come out. Now, I remember, I haven't seen this vision in my head yet. I saw the vision much prior, but all I'm seeing is, oh, there's no place for him to come out. I'm looking at oncoming traffic. I walk out in front of him. He steps on the gas immediately right in front of him. I turn just as he hits the gas. I turn because, you know, our heads move pretty quick. I'm just tall enough at four feet for my eyes to see above the hood of the car and see he's still looking at oncoming traffic. So he doesn't see me. He steps on the gas, hits me on my left side, throws me out into three lanes of oncoming traffic. I have time to pray to say, God, whatever you do, please don't let him roll over my pelvis. I hear my wheelchair crumpling underneath his car. I tuck and roll like we've been taught in martial arts as best as I can with a crazy, crazy curvature of my back, right? I yeah. tuck and roll, the wheelchair gets crumpled underneath his car. And then I, I literally hit my right side, roll across my back and I'm laying on my left side. He stops with his driver's side wheel resting on my pelvis. And he rolled oh. four inches, he would have crushed me, right? And so literally I had, the, and I had that moment of prayer, please, whatever you do, yeah. don't let it roll over my pelvis right? Not a single accident in those, in that traffic coming at us, not a single car, right? And later in retrospect, in meditation, I saw an angel standing in each lane of traffic. And I don't know what your audience believes, but I'm just telling you my experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, About eight feet tall, super thin, right? You don't see any, I didn't see any like faces and all of that. Okay. Um, And then um, that just so happened that in that instance, there was an EMT team in that restaurant eating. They rushed out. I'm rolling around in pain, rolling around in pain. And they're like, stop moving, stop moving. You can make it worse. I was like, I'm in pain. <laughs> and they're, like, they're like, but stop. Can you move your toes? And I stopped for a minute. I was like, I haven't moved my toes in 10 years. Because of my disability, you know, my muscles just got yeah. weaker. Yeah. You know, and so here's the crazy thing. They weren't just in there at that moment. They picked me up and took me across the street to the hospital. Oh. I was meant to die that day. I was meant to experience this. And what happened was for the next four months in physical therapy, why physical therapy? Because I was for some unknown reason in excruciating pain. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. Nothing that they tried, electric stimulation, meditation or massage. Um, uh, exercise, stretching, all that, nothing worked, right? Pool yeah. therapy, aqua therapy, nothing worked. Finally, my physical therapist after four months said, look, I don't know what else to do. I've consulted every book that I could find. I've talked to every mentor I have. He said, I finally talked to one of my mentors and went through everything with him. He said, the only thing he could think that it might be is that your pubic bone got popped out of place. And I was in excruciating pain. I wow. couldn't sit up. I couldn't lay down. I couldn't roll over. I couldn't eat very well by myself. I couldn't shower on the sitting on the hard surface of the bottom of the bathtub. I had a hard time going to the bathroom because of balance and because of the physical pain. Yeah. You know, my mom actually took time off of work and spent, I think, a couple of months with me. I can't remember how long, but, she, you know, she stayed with me for a while and took time off of work just to make sure that I was okay. So. Yeah. He says, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I'm going to palpate your, your pubic bone to see if it's out of place. Sure enough, my right hip had been popped out of place. So when he popped that back into place, let me tell you, that was excruciating pain. He popped that thing back in your back in the place. My eyes roll on the back of my head. I'm like, ah, 
right? My body tries to escape yeah. from him as he's hurt, as he pops back into place. But the moment, this is critical, everybody should listen. The moment that the pain dissipated, immediately I was filled with gratitude. Immediately mm -hmm. I was filled with appreciation yeah. and then gratitude. Oh, the pain was gone. The suffering was gone. There was this immediate release. And in my heart, in my mind opened up. I was so profoundly grateful for what I had in that moment. And that guy got something back because the pain was gone. That, that was the moment that yeah. everything came alive for me. That moment was critical for me to understand the moment that I said earlier in October when I had the vision. Yeah of the light coming through me because in the next few months that followed that, I realized that that vision of the pillar of light coming through, filling me up and saying love was not about me teaching other people to love themselves. Although it was, it was more about me learning to love myself and appreciate who I am and what I have so that I could help other people learn to love themselves. Yes. Beautiful. It's so awesome. I almost don't want to talk now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so forgive me everybody if you made it through that long story because I know it's a long story but I wanted you to understand these pieces and parts of me because I wanted you to understand that the process of growth is the process of release first right mm -hmm. a seed has to break through the sprout inside of the seed has to break through the shell and then it releases the shell to the ground and grows out of it and beyond it it doesn't stay connected necessarily. And if it does, it just turns into something that the, the plant can feed on and grow from, just mm -hmm. like the pain and the suffering that you might be experiencing emotionally or psychologically or physiologically, even spiritually. Release and then let that be something, let that be food for your growth. Okay, let that nourish your growth, your liberation, your freedom. Set yourself free first by releasing. Beautiful. Um, how did you then, so you've been a motivational speaker, how did you come to this program that you do? Um, how, how did that happen? So in 2014, a friend of mine gave me a call. I was debt free, amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was looking at traveling again. I was looking at like going to just different events and just like mm -hmm. enjoying my time. Right. And he called me and said, Hey man, I'm going to go to this event in uh, San Diego with this guy named Nick Unsworth, uh, you know, he's a, a business coach and, you know, it's going to be sort of motivational, sort of conference-like, and it's going to be really cool. And I was like, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. I'm in. Yeah. And, you know, he's like, okay, cool. I'll send you some, um, some videos and some links just so you know who we're going to see. And I was like, all right, cool. Well, I didn't look at any of the videos. I didn't look at any of the links, right? I just went just because it was fun in San Diego and I just wanted to go, yeah. right? So I show up and the first time that I'd ever seen this guy was when he comes up on stage and I fell in love with him. He's mm -hmm. kind, he was generous, he was funny. Um, I loved what he talked about. I loved all of his staff. I loved the people that he had on stage, the yeah. people that he had out in the, um, uh, that were sponsors out in the lobby. Those people um, were super kind. So I said, this guy, and my intent was not to spend a dollar. I was like, I'm not spending any money. I'm debt free, this is amazing. Yeah. Well, I was so, enamored and enraptured by the fact that he surrounded himself by such amazingly good people and yeah. he said something on stage at one point <clears throat> he said do you want to be in the same place that you were or that you are now in a year from now and i said absolutely not mm -hmm. i do want to be debt free right but what i want more than that is that i want to really expand in my business i want to expand my speaking and yeah. so i met with him and he suggested that I became, become a coach. And so mm -hmm. I didn't just meet with him. I actually said, you know what? I'm in. I like this cat. So I bought into my first coaching program. And I really didn't know anything about coaching at this point. I yeah. didn't even realize like, there was this whole world of coaching. <laughs> well, I remember yeah. hearing Tony Robbins talk about coaching like maybe 10 years ago. And I was like, ah, coaching, you're just calling it something different. It's so motivational speaking. I'm staying old school. You yeah. know? And so I didn't know that there was a whole, like, literally, like, there's a whole, a uh, society, a whole yeah. like, community, like globally um, on coaching, helping people to actually identify who they are or what mm -hmm. they want, where they want to go and how to get there, yeah. right? Because so many of us have just like accepted like what, what we have, status quo, mm -hmm. and we want to go somewhere. So yeah. I signed up, this guy said, hey, you know what, why don't you actually, 
because I was like, I really wanted to do something about love. And he's like, yeah. why don't you become the love coach? You know, and he actually, he is the one who actually branded me the love guru. And he started oh. using it and caught on with my clients and caught on with uh, my colleagues and it caught on with my entrepreneurial friends and it caught on with, you know, my friends. And so yeah. now I'm the love guru and I love that. It just means the world to me. I can't even not say it, <laughs> not smiling. It just makes me feel cheesy inside, like in a good cheesy yeah. way. Um, so he led me into becoming a coach and, you know, through any business person is going to go through an evolution. Any person in personal development and self-development is going to go through an evolution. Just the same over the past two years, I've gone through an evolution and I'm mm -hmm. actually returning to more speaking engagements and retreats in 2017 because mm -hmm. that's what I really, really love. The coaching is amazing. Yeah. I love that piece too, but it's going to be speaking, um, and retreats and coaching and programs and um, these things. So it's not going to just be a coaching anymore. It's also yeah. going to be live events because I love working with the masses, you know, yeah. and then really down with a single person is beautiful too. Watching them begin to flower and release and open up and become free themselves. It's remarkable how free the human being can be. It's remarkable how much we can actually love. It's remarkable yeah. how much we can actually receive and how much truly manifest on our own beautiful yeah real life is just like the lotus flower you come from the muck and the mire at the bottom of the pond right you might have been born to a beautiful family but you know you're going to go through some difficulties mm -hmm. and once you reach the surface all of a sudden you start to blossom and bloom and yeah. beautiful fragrance you share with other people that love that kindness yeah beautiful and i'm going to ask you this because i suspect that I'm wondering about it, and I'm, I'm suspecting that viewers will be. So since you're a love guru and you're a relationship coach, yes. I guess we are curious about whether you have been in relationships, whether you, whether so, you, yeah, go ahead. So, um, Gina, this is crazy. Sixth grade through kindergarten, super easy, right? Yeah. Like a little yeah. girl for every, like, I think every season. Mm -hmm. Maybe first and second grade, no, definitely kindergarten. I had two. I even remember their names right now. <laughs> I mean, so crazy, right? Um, and I fell in love. I love this story. I fell in love my first time in third grade. Um, mm. And, oh, I love this story. I don't tell this story very often, very rarely. So you're bringing it out of me. Uh, <laughs> I was in the third grade and I was walking towards my teacher, Mrs. Bale, right? And um, uh, tall, thin lady, short gray hair. I remember she wore these big turtlenecks and like a sweater over top of that and, you know, corduroy yeah. pants. It's crazy. I remember all this. And her door, I'm walking forward. Her door is on the left side of the hall. So I'm on the left side of the hall. Like, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. like I'm in England driving on the, the yeah. opposite side of the street. I almost did it wrong. Um, so, and I see down the hall about probably 40 or 50 feet on the other side of the hall walking towards me a second grade little girl with blonde hair and she walks, she's, I'm walking up to my teacher. She's walking up to her teacher and I'm about to turn left. And she turns, um, she turns, you know, to my right, to her left yeah. in her classroom. And my heart just immediately fell in love with this little girl. And uh -huh. I was like, like I had no clue what just hit me. Like yeah. it hit my head, it filled up my heart. And I was just like, wow, what was that? Like this, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, then I went into class and became a third grade little boy again. Right. And yeah. I totally forgot about girls. Um, so, but then seventh and eighth grade was really rough for me, mm -hmm. okay, because puberty, you know, hormones, high school was rough for me because like, I liked these girls and I could never get a date and I didn't know yeah. how to get a date. And I lacked the, the confidence and, you know, um, yeah. I was confident. you put me on stage, you put me in front of a television camera, you put me in front of an audience, no problem. That was easy. You put me in front of a girl that I liked and I didn't know what to say. Yeah. So I learned to become every woman's friend, right? And yeah. then, um, and there's more to that little girl that I fell in love with in second grade. Like I met her again mm -hmm. later and, you know, it's, it's just a, to me, a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. But, uh, then in co college, I also, uh, I started, like I dated once or twice a little bit. I had a girlfriend then, and then yeah. I didn't date much for a while, but then, um, you know, then I met somebody and we, she and I dated on and off for 10 years and things were much yeah. better. And now as I grow, I grow in my ability, my level of confidence, because now I don't consider my disability. Now I consider yeah. what I can do for my partner. And so as, as we're speaking today, right now, a few, like a week before Christmas, I'm not currently in a relationship. However, yeah. um, I just recently met a beautiful lady um, mm -hmm. who 
I am sort of beginning to court a little bit. It's, yeah. really, it's really, really nice. nice. Yeah. So it's just, my confidence level is totally different and I know what I yeah. bring now. I know what my value yeah. is. So yeah. now it's not hard for me. Now, yeah. you know, now it's just a matter of finding somebody that is important to me mm -hmm. that I want to pursue and spend time with. And yeah. so I love that question. It's beautiful. Thank mm -hmm. you. You're welcome. Um, and I, I guess you also you also fully got that message about love, right? Where where you've learned to love yourself, and so it's it's much easier for you to you know to have, have love, you holding that yourself that way to to be able to attract someone. Yes, so good absolutely. luck with that. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm I'm very hopeful actually. And to be honest, like you and I spoke a moment ago before we actually started the recording. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about manifesting and I was talking about yeah. one of the most critical aspects of manifesting is knowing. Yeah. Right? It's not about hoping. It's about knowing. And when you know you're yeah. solid in your mind, you're yeah. solid in your body, you're solid in your heart, you're yeah. solid in your intentions. And if you waver from that, that's where weakness and problems occur. Mm -hmm. If you say strong and solid and focused and intentional, it's amazing what happens. Now that's a bit more of a uh, kind of a, the way I'm expressing it and feeling it in my own body is a bit yeah. more of a masculine trait where I'm very focused and I'm driven, I'm motivated to move forward. And that's a little bit different than the way a woman might focus and become intentional uh, yeah. because the energies are different. Yeah. And so, but that same knowing, the same yeah. solidness, that same unity and connection between mind, body, heart, spirit, soul, psyche, however you want to say it, right? Mm -hmm. The four yeah. elements really spirit physical intellectual and emotional where there's nothing yeah. that separates and they're all together that's one of the most critical pieces for uh, manifesting mm -hmm. so I'm entering this connection with that kind of intention and when i waver i come back to this intention awesome. uh, you know if i may also address this yeah. because as a relationship coach a lot of people have said um, or like to say well if you're not currently in a relationship you're not currently married if you don't currently have children how can you help me and that's actually, it's a really valid question, but you don't have to be in a relationship to observe the human dynamics and how people exactly. relate to each other and the human ego and how the human ego clashes against somebody else's ego and how we can give and receive. Healthy relationships aren't give and take. Like everybody says, they're give and receive. There's mm -hmm. a profound difference yeah. between taking wow. and receiving. Yeah. And that's really important to know. And so, um, and I don't need to have children to know how to raise children because mm -hmm. I've spent so much time working with children, so much time working with couples. And I've literally, like the name Love Guru works for me too, because I've matched, I think somewhere between nine or 10 of my friends, I've matched and all but one has stayed married. Stayed married. Awesome. Yeah, so yeah. You know, match, make a match, make a, make me a match. Find me a find, catch yeah. me a catch. Awesome. So uh, this is the point in the interview where I, um, I ask uh, my guests to talk about specific tools that people can use. Um, and, and we are all referring in terms, you know, trauma and trust. And, but I think all of these work just they, So just let's talk about some of the things that you, you teach, uh, either you speak about or you coach your clients to do. And then that can lead uh, to a real life story of a client that stands out for you and then let's do that. So let me start with this. I'm probably gonna say something that's so commonly heard nowadays that I would speculate the vast majority of your, your um, speakers have said because it's critical, meditation. Mm. Meditation is foundational for mm. you to actually progress and to release and to mm. be able to move on to release and create space to allow someone or something to enter your life, to release and refocus on something that's important to you and move towards that, okay? Meditation helps you to untie or unlatch the anchor that's connected to your past and sets you free so that you can grow and move the way you want. Um, I would also say that journaling is really important. In mm -hmm. fact, um, one of my clients today, um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be getting online to send her one of my friend's journaling books because mm -hmm. I wrote a journaling book and uh, that book I think is very, very, I love the different techniques in there. And so mm -hmm. I like to teach from that, but I like to give that as a gift. So anybody who's watching this, 
right? If you ever decide to come and work with me, then that you forgot or forget. Uh, so I like to provide this for uh, for certain for certain yeah. people. I really think that it's going to be really beneficial for this particular woman that I'm working mm -hmm. with. Um, so journaling, meditation, really good. Using yeah. your body, physical exercise, running, jogging, eating healthy, all that stuff, right? Okay, so let's yeah. do something um, that's a little bit different. Neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis. I'm not mm -hmm. a hypnotist, okay? Mm -hmm. Although that is something that I'll be studying at some point in the near future. And neurolinguistic programming is something that I've been studying for a little while now. And I'm using that technique or those techniques. There's hundreds of yeah. neurolinguistic programming techniques on myself as well as on my clients, and they're phenomenal. And I don't want you to, when you start to think about neurolinguistic programming, well, what is it? What is it? What is it? Yeah. Um, neurolinguistic programming is sometimes described as the, um, the common language between the, the primal brain, sub, the subconscious or unconscious brain, and the neocortex or the new conscious brain. Mm. Right? It's a way for all of them to communicate effectively. It's also a way of getting um, yourself or someone else to get past problems that um, have bothered them for a long time. For example, a lot of times people will be in therapy for seven to 12 years, right? Yeah. And it just doesn't always work for them. Whereas someone who's good with neurolinguistic programming can help you release that immediately. How? Because neurolinguistic programming focuses on um, the mind, mm -hmm. physicality, the body, yeah. the emotions, and um, the senses. And it, it draws in the intellect a little bit too and energy. Yeah. Too. Okay. So it brings these together as one unified front. And here's the thing. They're not separate, but we think of them as separate things. Even in yeah. college, you study physiology, separate from biology, separate from chemistry, separate from psychology. Yeah. We actually have schools specifically for divinity or spirituality. So we separate yeah. these to study them. But the truth is the body and the mind and the soul and the heart, and the intellect doesn't separate those. Mm -hmm. okay? These yeah. are actually one unified force. So I will use neurolinguistic programming a lot to get people past issues and problems. Okay, I'm gonna give you a very simple example of this. Okay. This is something that people can do on their own. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to, uh, do you want, Mr. Lafa, do you want me to tell you the technique, or do you want me to walk people through a technique? We can walk them through. I think that's well, walk yeah. through. Okay, cool. So I'm going to change. I'm going to change this technique. So I'm going to walk them through or something. No, you know what? I'm going to keep this technique. Okay? okay. Because this is a technique that I I use on a regular basis. I've probably used it four times in the past week. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I used it just Friday on a female friend of mine who's struggling with um, her husband. Okay. And um, she's feeling very, very like downtrodden and very beat down and not very good about herself. So yeah. anybody, anybody who's listening, I'm going to encourage you to think about one person in your life who has said some things to you or um, hurt your feelings, or they commonly say a phrase to you that really bothers you. Like my grandmother, for example, will say, that's awesome. That's awesome. Everything is awesome to my grandmother. <laughs> which is fine if everything were awesome. Like it really grates on my mom because, yeah. you know, she doesn't feel like it's authentic, yeah. right? So it really grates on, on my mom. So is there something that somebody that you know really bothers you, makes you feel belittled, makes you feel small or, or less than? If, there's, if that's the case, I want you to think about that person. Close your eyes. Think about that person in front of you right now. And I want you to dress them however you want. You can dress them in a silly costume, a ridiculous outfit, uh, an outfit that you see them wearing all the time, you know, they can be dressed super cool. I wouldn't dress them super cool if I were you because that just gives them more power. Okay. But if you want to dress them super cool, we're going to take that power um, that they have over you, not take their power, but we're going to take the power they have over you and give it back to you. So you can dress them however you want. Okay. Now that you see them, I want you to hear them say that phrase to you, right? Maybe they say it in a very aggressive, harsh tone. Maybe they say it very condescending, like, you're less than them, right? But whatever it is, I want you to see them and hear them say that. Now, remember, we're always breathing. We're always inhaling. We're always exhaling. We're always inhaling. We're always exhaling. There's often a pause between that. So I'm going to ask you to inhale, pause, exhale, pause. I'm not even going to be specific about inhaling through your mouth or your nose or exhaling through your mouth or your nose. Inhale, pause, exhale, pause. 
Now, when you inhale, I want you to see yourself getting bigger. And as you see yourself getting bigger, I want you to smile at the fact that you're becoming a little bit more empowered because you're bigger. And then I want you to pause and smile. And I want you to exhale. When you exhale, I want you to see them getting a little bit smaller. And as you see them getting smaller, they say what they normally say, right? And the first time you hear it in the normal voice, and then you pause after you exhale. And then when you inhale, you inhale and you give it a little bit bigger. And as you get a little bit bigger, you smile, right? Now you're smiling, not just at the fact that you're getting bigger and more powerful, but you're smiling at them because you realize, oh, they don't actually have power over you. And then when you exhale, they get smaller. And as they get smaller, their voice gets a little bit squeakier, right? Almost like they're on helium or like they're just this little Mickey Mouse kind of thing, right? And then when you inhale, you get bigger. And as you get bigger, you smile, right? Because of the power and you're smiling at them now during the pause. Because when you smile at them during the pause, you like realize, oh, they're getting, they don't have any power over me. So then when you exhale, they get smaller. No, you just do awesome. Good, whatever it is, squeaky little voice, right? And they get smaller. And then you pause and you inhale. And as you inhale, smile, right? Smile at them. And exhale, they get smaller. You get bigger. As they get smaller, their voice gets a little squeak. That's when you, you can't get out of here, right? You inhale, you get bigger and bigger. And, and smile and exhale. And as you exhale, they get smaller and smaller. Their voice gets squeakier and squeakier and squeakier, right? And you're going to do this process until they become the size of the smallest little ant that you've ever seen. Tinier than the smallest little ant. And then you inhale one last time, right? And you get bigger, even bigger still. And when you exhale, you exhale. And remember, you're smiling at them, at them. You're smiling at them because you're like, oh, they're so cute. Look how cute they're at that little. And as you exhale this last time, when you exhale, they get smaller, but not so small you can't see them, but they're like half the size of an ant. And you can't hear them because they're so tiny, right? And you exhale and you just sit there and smile at them for a minute and breathe normally. And look how small they are and look how ginormous, how big you are. And I want you to reach down very, very delicately. I don't want you to hurt them. Okay, reach down very, very delicately and pick them up. Tiny, you can't even hear them. They're so, so small, right? You're smiling at them still because you're like, oh, look how cute you are at this size, right? And you kiss them on the left cheek and you kiss them on the right cheek, right? And then I want you to gently, because you don't want to hate, you just want to love, right? And they're in this bad place. So then I want you to take them and I want you to put them somewhere safe. You can put them behind you, which is great. Pick them up and literally like, turn around behind you and put them on a shelf, put them far away, like literally physically move your body Put them somewhere okay you can put them in your pocket if you want if you need to pull them out later but you don't have to and now that you put them behind you or you put them in your pocket somewhere open your eyes and ask yourself do they have the power over you anymore and i'll bet the answer is wow they don't have that impact on me anymore i don't feel bad about myself anymore i do feel like i have power again why because we brought in the biology and the neurology and we brought these things together and we allowed you to grow into your power and we let their power get smaller and smaller and smaller and dissipate till they had virtually nothing. Okay. We just changed your neurology. Now you might be a little shaky. You might be like, wait, what, what happened? You can bring their power back if you want to. You don't have to, right? They can stay small, right? And it may just be that one instance that you focus on, but you can do this anytime you want. Okay. This also works if you always see them up here, like you're sitting on the floor and they're up on a stage. Yeah. So every time you inhale, you get taller. And every time you exhale, they get sh shorter and shorter and shorter. They wind up on the floor, you wind up on stage. And then uh, breathe in. And as you breathe in, you get bigger and they get smaller as you exhale. So then make it even bigger like that. If you really need to make a very clear distinction between someone who's taken your power before or mm -hmm. tries to take your power now or in the past, okay? So you have the power, it's always in you. Thank you, that was beautiful. It's actually really effective too. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> Can we ask how you felt before and how you feel now? Yeah, I, I really feel the, the difference in the, it's something that I've actually been working on the last couple of week, days. And so this is, this is really on point for me. So thank you, thank well, you. Good. Well, good. I'm so glad. And that's what our intention was, right? Yes. It would touch our audience. And when I'm speaking, you're my audience. And when you're speaking, I'm your audience. Yeah. Good. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so um, it, it, do you have a, a real life example of a client or that, that you, you would like to speak about with who has used meditation, journaling, neurolinguistic programming to, to make uh, big Yeah. Well, I just used this specific technique on my mom um, oh. and a couple of other techniques on my mom because um, my grandmother is a hoarder and she can also be 
pretty mean sometimes. Mm -hmm. She's always very nice to me, right? Mm -hmm. But she bites everybody else. Um, and whatever the reason is, you yeah. know, she's very, she snips at other people and, you know, nobody has any real understanding and she always has mm -hmm. to be right. And um, mm -hmm. it's truly unfortunate, right? She drives people away. And so yeah. it hurts my mom because my mom is so loving and so kind and yeah. moved to Florida to be able to help my grandmother and has done everything she can. And my grandmother wants her stuff more than she wants her family. Mm. Um, and so this hurts my mom. So we did, um, and I'm using this technique because it was literally just earlier this week that we did it. Um, yeah. Not just this technique, but this example. And so she actually was really, she was, she called me in tears and she was just breaking down and felt overwhelmed and she was feeling crushed and she had yeah. all these things that she had to do on her, on, you know, like all these obligations, mm -hmm. um, family coming in for the holidays. You yeah. know, my grandmother has been being um, mean, the neighbors were moving out. And so there was all this like in an activity in and out of her mm -hmm. house because, you know, people were saying goodbye and bringing stuff yeah. over she was trying to accomplish some things and she worked seven days straight and she was exhausted, you know, just all this stuff. And she just was, she was, she was, yeah. crushed. she was crushed and she just needed so, some help. So I used some forms, of, a couple of two different forms of neurolinguistic programming. One where we pulled out all the pain, right? All the yeah. suffering, all the anger. And she yeah. wasn't able to get all of it, but we got enough of it. that um, Then we pulled it out and we did some transformation with it and then we put it back. And she's like, the pain in my shoulders is gone. And, and she's like, I feel lighter. And she's like, wow, that really worked. And my mom was an art therapist for 27 mm -hmm. years, right? She literally was an art psychotherapist. Yeah. Uh, and so, excuse me. So she knows about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and that worked really well with her. And then we did the same um, technique that I just did with you and made my grandmother super small. We put her in her pocket, you know, or put her on the back shelf. I can't remember where yeah. it was. Um, or uh, actually, since I did it with her over the phone, I don't know if she put it behind her or in the yeah. pocket. But afterwards, she was light, she was laughing, she was freer. She's like, oh my gosh, that was so helpful. She called me later that night. She's like, I felt so much better all day. She called me the next day. She's like, wow, this is great. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I didn't create it. I'm yeah. just understanding the principles and applying the principles. Okay? Beautiful. Physical pain left her. Psychological and emotional pain left her. Mm -hmm. Right? And this openness and this ease and this feeling of being crushed left her. And all yeah. we did is we just rewired your neurology. Okay. Yeah, beautiful. So um, let's talk a little bit more, uh, PJ. You have um, a gift or a product that uh, our, our viewers can get. And also just broadly about all of the services that you have, your website, uh, how people can get in touch with you and all of those things. Um, I like to make myself as accessible as possible. And mm -hmm. so everybody gives gifts, right? They often will give yeah. a program or they'll give a free book or yeah. something like that. And I think that's great. I love all of that stuff too. And yeah. I've given it in the past and I'll give it again in the future. But I love to make personal connections with people. Mm -hmm. You're going to get so much more out of actually a one-on-one -on -one with me. So yeah. I invite people who feel like, well, I really need something. I'm looking yeah. for love in my life. I'm looking to learn to love myself. I need more confidence, more courage. You know, there's something in my life I want to go after and get, but I don't know how. If you need something, I'm going to give Sri Lanka my um, actual link to my okay. schedule, my calendar, so you can sign up for a 30-minute discovering true love conversation with me. I call it discovering true love. Um, so a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one call with me, you sign up on my calendar, you give me your phone number, I pick up the phone, I call you. If you wanna record it, we can absolutely record it. If you wanna do a video, we can absolutely do video. If you're out of the country, I will Skype with you. There's no problem. I have clients that are out of the country right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I absolutely love because it gives you and I a chance to talk about where you are and how can we make the world better for you. Okay. That's beautiful. That's the best gift of all. <laughs> I hope so. I really yeah. love that. And the way people can get a hold of me, um, I will give you my link. Um, yeah. so go to provide that in the. Yeah, um, in the, uh, yeah. and as as I've told the viewers, uh, we will, we are starting a private Facebook group for for the for everyone who signed up for this. Perfect. And so everything, all of your information will be there, and your calendar, the the link will be there. So. 
Um, yes, the, the whole idea is that I, I want this Facebook group to be a place where people feel held and as they're making this transition. Um, so, um, yeah, and, your, and what's your website called, PJ? Right now it's pjswisdom.com, pjswisdom.com, pjswisdom.com. And so if you um, need me, you can go to that website and you can um, either type in a message to me and I'll, I will get it. Or what's easier, email yeah. me directly. I make myself as accessible as possible. And if I can't do it, if I can't reach out to you, I have an assistant who can help you. So um, it's simple, pj at pjswisdom.com. Easy. I try to make myself super accessible. pj at pjswisdom.com. And I or someone will get to you. And if I don't or they don't, email me again. <laughs> I, want to be, I want to make myself accessible to you. The whole point of making the world a better place is by making connection with people. Or the mm -hmm. best way to do that is to make connections with people. Okay. Cool. Um, we're almost at the end of the interview. So I just want you to sort of wrap up or, or touch on things that you think that we didn't touch enough and, and sort of talk to our viewers about the whole topic, the whole. Um, may I take just a moment to allow myself to open up and, and feel what I feel is the most important. Okay, thank sure. you. Give me, one, give me about 10 seconds, okay? Sure. I feel like going back to one of the things that I said first is most important instead of bringing something in. And that is the best way to learn to love is to learn to release first. And my message has always been, well, I say always been, my message currently is mm -hmm. seek not to love more, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't seek to love other people more. Don't seek even to love yourself more. This seems a little contrary to what I've been saying this whole time, but instead, seek to remove the obstacles that separate you from love. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to what I was talking about before, like the seed, the seed releases the shell, right? The seed, the, the life inside, the sprout inside releases the shell, okay? Seek not to love more, but instead to remove the obstacles that separate you from love, anger, disappointment, hurt, loss, frustration, doubt, fear, worry, any of that. In the Christian Bible, okay, and I love religion, so I'm not so proselytizing one way or the other. Um, within the Christian Bible, they talk about the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. If I take that single mustard seed and I shave a little tiny piece of that mustard seed off, that little tiny piece, like you can barely even see it, and I name that little shaving fear, worry, or doubt, and I reattach that, I no longer have a mustard seed of faith. I have a mustard seed that's been tainted. Yeah. So be cautious of that, okay? Love purely and freely and innocently and cleanly. But the way you do that is to open up and release those things that have been obstacles or blocks or anchors from you moving forward. Once you release that, release those, once you remove the shell, everything that's left is nothing but love and life, light. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. For the, for the viewers, I just want to reiterate again, um, what you are seeing in PJ is a real life example of, of, of someone who has moved through trauma and lives in trust and has a deep faith and is living a life of power, passion and purpose. So thank you. This has been such a wonderful interview. Thank you so much. And, you know, I think we really did meet our intention of being open and, and allowing of what had to come through to come through. Yes, thank you. Beautiful. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I am very honored and very fortunate to call you my friend and feel very blessed to have had the opportunity and be invited on your, um, on your summit. Ladies, gentlemen, whoever is listening, continue to listen, continue to love continue to release so that you can love and the world gets better every day for you and for me and for the children to be. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.